really we've ramped that up since about 2008 or 9, before my time there, uh, is that there is no one size fits all. Uh, accessibility is not clearly a, uh, a threshold you cross and now you're there and you're done. Um, it's always a work in progress and it always involves um, talking with and, and responding to the needs of individuals. So uh, the fact that we welcome and host in the community space 55 to 60 individuals each month, um, it's a hospitality industry and so in some ways uh, we're all about needing to serve uh, the needs of, of the artists who come here. So. Um, it, yeah, I mean, th that's the, a short answer. Something that just occurred to me is, what month were you in Vermont? October. <laughs> Actually, it was like 80 degrees one day, and then uh, um, the rest of the day it was kind of chilly. <laughs> so, um, Ryan, my question for you is, as an organization, how has hosting the Creative Access Fellows impacted the Vermont Studio Center? Yeah, it's helped to enrich the mission. Uh, the founding mission of the Studio Center is to be an inclusive international community. And so this just gets right to the heart of the inclusivity um, aspect of that. Um, and there's no one, creative access is just sort of a term we've, we've used to, to name a lot of programs. Um, we've had residency fellowships for artists and writers who are blind or have visual impairment those who are deaf or have um, heart, or hard of hearing and folks who are, uh, have spinal cord injury or we had a previous partnership with the Christopher Reed Foundation that was more broadly for uh, artists who use wheelchairs so um, it wasn't really limited to people who had a, a specific injury uh, but could have spinal um, conditions, diseases. Uh, so it's really, it's, it's been enlightening. Um, it helps us in all aspects of what we do because like I said, Fundamentally, a residency experience is um, a kind of hospitality experience. You're being welcomed. You're taking a risk no matter who you are. You're leaving behind um, all of your regular support systems. You're uh, making deals with your partner, your spouse, your children, your family, your pets, maybe your employers, uh, to come away uh, from the routine of your own studio and your home and doing what that, that creative practice that you do in private, you're doing it then, uh, it's not exactly public, but you're, you're taking that and coming to a new place with 55 other people and, and practicing um, in a shared space. So it, there's some risk involved and we're, it's, just, it's thrilling to see that every month. And it's really rejuvenating for the staff. We're all artists and writers as well. That's how I came to be um, development director and writing program director at the Studio Center was I'm a poet and I, I went there one frigid January uh, and spent the month writing and thought it was just the greatest experience I've ever had. So, um, I th yes, it, it, get, it helps us in all that we do and it especially strengthens our, our mission. I think something that they do really well there too is when uh, always asking for feedback from us, which was really nice to know that, you know, what they were implementing and doing was based off of the actual people that were benefiting, benefiting from it. Um, so it's, it was really nice to, to, to be asked like what I needed and how did we, how are we doing, how could we do better? So um, many artists I talk to um, who go to residencies, what they value is being part of a community of artists dedicated to art. And I've um, often found that artists with disabilities can often feel isolated um, and not part of a community. And so my question for you, and this is my fun question, is how has being welcomed into this community changed your art? It has made it a little more focused and kind of um, realized where I could go with it. Um, like I said, I had been playing around with a lot of different mediums and um, types of ways of creating art, but um, I had the experience of having to share my work um, and a slide presentation and it really made me think about the work that I had done in the past and where I was and what I wanted to, where I wanted to go in the future and where I wanted to go with it. Um, and I think in the past I looked at my art as something separate than my work as well. Um, like I said, I, I run this nonprofit and when I started the nonprofit, I thought, okay, I'm gonna be 
doing this, the nonprofit management, um, and I won't have time for the art. Um, and it was something really scary for me because I was like, if I'm, if I'm going to do this, I'm not going to have time for it, and I don't think I want that to be the case. Um, so being at this residency, I was able to, to realize that I'm doing a lot of art-related things through the nonprofit for awareness, and I started seeing the component of like social justice and what, um, what an impact that could do. Um, and so I'm, I've sort of started to merge my art with what I want to say and what I want to share with the world and not, um, not thinking of it as I'm, I'm painting a pretty picture or I'm taking this um, interesting photograph. And now it's like, what do I want to say with it um, and really the power that it has? Wow. Okay, so... Um Ryan, I'm asking you to take off your arts administrator hat and put on your poet hat. How has working with artists with disabilities changed your work? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I've had some time to think about it now. Uh, it's really strengthened my discipline. Um, I'm not someone who shows up at the desk every morning and writes for a certain amount of time um, easily. So it's, it's, that's something that I struggle with. Um, and, and seeing artists, really just everybody who comes to the Studio Center, but people I get to know better, uh, I'm always inspired by not just the work they make and, and how they carry themselves and who they are, but just the fact that they are putting so much aside to put this forward and, and put it primarily in their lives, like to, to be the artist, to be the writer. And so I'm just thinking of one uh, writer in particular, uh, this, this guy Manny, who came to the Studio Center in 2013, um, and had, had been an engineer um, and due to Usher syndrome had, um, was blind and, and also had deafness. And, and he uh, had been toying with poetry for a while and really found like, okay, if I'm ever really going to take myself seriously as a writer, I need to do something like this. Um, it, it's transformed his life. He, he went from, from there um, to an MFA program and just finished that uh, this, this past May. And we've been in touch ever since he was there in 2013. And, just his, his dedication, um, his choice to be a writer um, inspired me to like, get to the desk more frequently, to do the writing, and when I'm not writing, to be reading poetry. Um, so that's just one personal anecdote of many. So I'm not an artist, um, but I work with a lot of artists, and I have a lot of artists who are friends. And I've noticed that oftentimes the deepest connection that artists have with each other is the artist to artist connection. Like there is a moment when people connect sort of, I, I swear it's like when Voldemort and Harry Potter's wands connect and there's this arc of light that goes across and then something happens and everybody kind of goes from here to whoa, here with their work because there's a conversation, a concept, a light bulb goes off. And I'm wondering whether or not you've experienced that, whether you had that at the studio center at all or have had it since. Yeah, it did happen there. Um, I, I um, went, well, one of the things that I remember and, and um, really thought was one of the best things was that when I was there, um, usually when I go somewhere, there's people ask you like, what happened to you or how were you injured? And that question always comes up. Um, but I was there for about three or four days and nobody asked me that. And all the conversations that we had were around art and what are you working on today and what what kind of materials are you using and how did that go and so it was all art and it was so refreshing to um, to not have that question come up I mean, even though I don't mind it and actually when it did come up I brought it up myself because it was related to to my work um, but yeah I mean I we, we I was able to, you know, meet other artists and talk about what we were doing. And actually, one day, this was a funny, funny way of happening. But um, the person in the studio next to my mine um, turned out to be a, a personal care attendant for this woman, um, and he was there for a month. And I, we just started talking about personal care attendants and stuff like that. Um, and then one day, when I was really cold, and I got I just needed to like move around and my body needed to, to stretch. Um, 
my care attendant that came with me is actually a yoga instructor as well. So we, we just decided to do yoga in the studio. And we got on the floor and we knocked on the, door, on the wall and we're like, hey, can you come over and help me transfer onto the floor? Um, and we ended up just taking a series of photographs. This was totally not planned, but um, the, the walls were all white and we just did a series of photographs of me it started off doing yoga and then we looked at the photographs and they looked really weird, like in just different shapes and it didn't even look like a body anymore. And so I was like, okay, this is like, started making me think about body image and um, nothing came of the photos yet, but um, it's gotten me to think about body image and photography and um, disability. And so um, him and I keep in touch still and it was, it was cool. So, Ryan, have you seen those Voldemort Harry moments? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, what, that's what kept me there for five years. I loved it. Um, it, it, it happens, yeah. You, you get this many people from, again, all walks of life and all over the world uh, together, eating meals together, um, living in the same houses, and then next door to each other in the studios, humming along in this hive activity uh, week after week. It, it's, it's incredible. So those, those connections do happen. It's how I... Um, I mean, that's how I met my partner. Like, she's a painter, and we met there at the Studio Center, and that's led us here to Pittsburgh. Um, so that happens all the time, and, and I think that just underscores the reason the inclusivity has always been in the mission for the past 32 years at the Studio Center, which is just the, the founding ideal is that creativity is this universal human endeavor, right? Like, it's nothing, that's not a secret, and we've heard it before, and I, I imagine it'll be repeated again. Um, it, it unifies us in that way, um, despite where we're coming from. And in fact, that enriches the fact that we're all coming from somewhere else. So um, that was always inspiring and real and felt um, and, and intense, <laughs> because then people leave on a Friday and, and then 55 more people show up on Sunday. <laughs> And we start again, um, but yeah. That just makes my head hurt. Um, so one of the things that I'm always curious about, because I'm a geeky grant maker too, is what happens afterwards? What is our long-term impact? Um, so I know about the Vermont Studio Center because we do these professional development grants for individual artists in every single round, three times a year, we get at least two people who are applying for funding to go to the Vermont Studio Center because it's such a sought after residency and it means so much on people's um, resumes. My personal thinking is it takes a minimum of five years to really process a residency. I mean, I think there's a lot that comes from it. So I wanna ask you, Rebecca, what, how long has it been, A, since you've been there? And how do you think it's gonna impact you long term? It's been two years. I went in October of 2014. Yeah, that's two years. <laughs> and um, I mentioned this earlier to you, but I, when I got there, um, I felt like a really big fraud. Like I was an artist. I, like I wasn't an artist and I didn't belong there and everyone else around me was doing all these great things and I probably, you know, like how did they let me in here? And um, But... Um, it has impacted me in a way that I don't feel like that much of a fraud anymore. <laughs> and um, I'm more comfortable um, sharing my artwork. Um, I, I didn't often share it. Um, I was able to be a part of a show and actually exhibit my work um, November of last year, which was really cool. Um, and I'm working on another one for this coming up this year um, and trying to just get my artwork out there. And I, like I said, it's made, it's made me more comfortable with um, identifying myself as an artist and, and sharing my work. All right, so Ryan, you have to put this in contents because of everyone who comes for a residency. Right, well, we, we do have exit interviews, and then we also, with particularly you know, funded programs like the Creative Access Program from the uh, Craig Nielsen Foundation, we, we do follow up. Um, in fact, we, I reached out to Rebecca and others uh, this year um, to see where, where they were and what they've been up to in the past couple of years. Um, 
so that we could report in terms of long-term impact. Uh, v lots of gallery shows, lots of readings, and lots of those connections that happen um, by meeting other artists, it doesn't really manifest until months or years later that suddenly, oh, this person I met at the studio center, they have a gallery in Houston, and now I will have a show down there. Um, that kind of thing happens all the time. Uh, we're also invested in just the long-term um, betterment of the field of artist residencies, and so we've been working with the Alliance of Artist Communities, which is the uh, a wonderful um, umbrella organization that most all of the several hundred of residencies in the U.S. belong to, um, to determine, uh, to kind of set, thanks to artists um, who give us the, the feedback and have the, the first-hand experience, just what are best practices for the field. Um, it's something the Alliance is taking really seriously, and, and, but hasn't yet had the uh, capacity to, to undertake um, just understanding and assessing what's out there in terms of which residencies are accessible. Um, and so that's really taking shape rather quickly, um, thanks to this consortium that we, we started last year. So I'm going to point something out here. Um, artists in this room, any artist generally can go online to the Alliance for Artist Communities and look up residencies. But there are three arts residencies and these creative access residencies and there's a deaf artist residency. So there's like 10 where they specifically welcome people with disabilities, right? So if you take the thousands of artist residencies that are available and you think of the ones that are advertising themselves as welcoming to artists with disabilities, your opportunities as an artist with a disability are far fewer than otherwise. <laughs> So, um, I'm just pointing that out to everyone in this room, and I am also pointing out our opportunity for advocacy with the Alliance for Artists Communities. Just keep that in your heads. Action step, post-it note. Um, so, Rebecca, what, what do you want the Alliance for Artists Communities to do to increase the number of opportunities for people with disabilities? Do you have any? Okay, I'm putting you really on the spot because that's a big, deep question. But um, you strike me as a person who's probably given it some thought. I think I would like at questions to be asked on what do you need and how can we include you in our programs and in our uh, residencies or you know in in anything really. Um, but being asked and being included and um, being able to participate in that process of what would make, make it inclusive. Um, I think it's really important to be included um, and have that voice and, and, and really um, these decisions not to be taken without, without us. Yeah, I definitely echo that. We, everything we've learned at the Studio Center about accessibility uh, in terms of the campus itself um, has come from artists. Uh, so I'd say put out an open call. Um, that is part of the plan, I believe, to, to just I invite input from artists. Um, but I think also uh, finding ways to pool resources. Um, because I think that we've, we've at least encountered at VSC that the success comes best when there's not just the accessible campus and the facility, but also the, uh, the programming, the fact that there's a fellowship so that the whole experience is paid for, plus travel, plus a stipend, plus bringing a personal assistant if need be, and yes, the campus, like we'll have a studio and a house that's, that will work for you. Um, and I think that there are a number of residencies that have the accessible um, facilities but maybe uh, non-accessible to so many of us um, cost or other, other obstacles. And so I think that there's a way in which um, I think I'm excited about this consortium that we have started uh, and will continue and grow is that the Alliance can then really see um, and, and find ways to leverage funding that really makes that um, residency cost part uh, go away for artists and take away that obstacle. Yeah, that helps a lot. <laughs> So, you know, we have at, at LEAD and forever we say that the ADA is the floor, right? That is where you must be. But that covers effective communication and everything like that. But what you want is you want to be welcoming 
right? In a way that any artist can come in and it doesn't matter who or what they are, they are treated like every other artist and they interact with their surroundings and the people there as everyone else would. Um, so we were talking earlier about when you came back, when you were there, you gathered information for other artists to make their transition easier, correct? And then you went on to share it because I don't know if, how many of you know this, but there is a really tight network of artists with disabilities and information flies across <laughs> those networks so fast that um, they are your best asset, just so you know. And um, Christine is the hub for performers, just so you know. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about what you did while you were there to gather the information? Yes. Um, while I was there, I took a lot of pictures and I um, decided to uh, make a video, make, take videos of basically a lot of stuff. I mean, I didn't initially know what I was going to use it for, but I knew that I would need it someday. Um, so I had my uh, PA pretty much follow me around with my phone and record me getting into the studio, um, the handles on, the, on each of the doors, uh, the getting into uh, my housing, getting into the um, dining area, just everything, everything. I, um, and from behind me, so it would be you know, my perspective. Um, and I just kept those videos. And then um, the following year, a friend of mine, um, I, I told her she should apply. And she was nervous about the accessibility, so I sent her all the videos. And she, it was really helpful for her. I think um, she was very relieved to be able to see those and see what, um, what it would be like, um, because she did have a lot of questions. And she kept on asking me questions, and I could see the nervousness in, that, in her questions. I'm like, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. And finally, I just showed her all the videos, and then she was like, oh, OK. So, so yeah. That. And, and I should make sure that the Studio Center maybe gets that video from you <laughs> yeah. to have to share, if not to put on the sure. website for all, but at least you know, as people have questions to share. Um, we have done a practice of, of, of putting artists in touch with each other um, when, they, when they say that that would be something helpful. Um, so I'm sorry that didn't happen in your case. But. <laughs> That's okay. So uh, you know, we're talking about physical plant and things like accessibility, but what I think makes a big difference for a lot of people it, is the staff and the people and how when you show up, you're just like everybody else. Um, so what do you want, how do you want people to train their staff and what do you want to find when you go someplace like that? Um, I think staff knowing a little bit about disability and cross-disability knowledge is great too. Um, but again, going back to the asking questions, um, individual questions on what exactly um, is you need to be successful during your fellowship. So would you prefer to have them ask you or would you prefer to be the one to start the conversation? I think it depends. <laughs> Sometimes it's really nice to be asked because um, I was talking with my mom actually before coming here and I'm like everything is such a fight all the time to get what you need and sometimes it's a relief to just have someone say what do you need and it's like okay let me tell you what I need um, but yeah I mean I think it's also the responsibility of the artist um, to be their own advocate and be able to tell people what is needed and how it is um, how they need things provided so that's the asking and speaking up, I want you to talk about the listening and implementing half. Yeah, that's really more than half, I think, is the listening and implementing. Um, yeah, we, I mean, again, the Studio Center sort of uh, found its way into this without like clear decisions and plans, I think. It was the matter of artists uh, arriving before there were any program um, who, you know, say an artist uh, who uses a chair and, and we'd have to figure out how do, what do you need and how can we help you? Um, I mean, one example, again, going back to M Mani, um, who was there a few years ago, 
Uh, he uses a cane to get around and, and you know, curb edges and, and distinct zones where like grass ends and, and gravel begins are important, right? Um, our campus is, is sprawling and strange. We occupy 30 plus buildings within this um, old village in Vermont. Most of the buildings are repurposed. And so it, it came to things like asking him, um, there was no clear um, curb cut on the way from the dining hall and offices back to his uh, writing studio and, and home. And so uh, our plant director, Jim McDowell, sat down and asked, you know, talked with Manny and just said, well, wh what would you need? And then the listening involved, like, well, just something that would, you know, indicate where the parking lot ends because there's a, a large open parking lot, right? So to, to know where the open space um, ends and the sidewalk begins. And so they, they worked together and figured out a, a method of laying down hay bales that he could then feel. So there was a very temporary and one person solution, um, but I think that's emblematic of a lot of um, what we've done so far uh, in, in making things work for each person and what they need. Um, thankfully, there's also a strategic plan to renovate the campus over the next 10 years uh, with universal design in mind for each house and each studio. So. Uh, when there is an open studios night, which we do twice a month, um, where all the artists who feel like it open their doors and share, um, we, we won't be disincluding anyone um, because currently the upstairs studios are, are mostly not accessible, um, but within 10 years they all will be. So that's that's something to look forward to. But in the meantime, it's, it's completely about um, listening, empathy, and the fact that that's, that's what we do. It's a hospitality uh, environment, and so we want everyone to feel comfortable and welcomed. And taking action, too. I remember one, uh, one incident, uh, there was one of, the, one of the houses I needed to get into, and there was just a little lip, which I could have gotten over um, with just a push, but um, I think Harlan was, he just, by that afternoon, there was a ramp there, and when I needed to be there at that time, I was like, beaming with joy because there was a ramp there for me but um i could have done it but he 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 saw that there was that issue and he fixed it so wait so i want to break that down a little how did you contact him and say there's an issue or did he how, how did that it conversation was actually start? another artist that noticed it and was she went over and spoke up for me which was nice okay so that's why we love art right you know, um, I, I mean, I've worked in the disability advocacy field for quite a long time, and that only happens in this community, so be proud of yourselves. <laughs> um, it should happen everywhere, but it really happens here. Um, so I'm, I'm the, one of the questions that I'm wondering about now is we're talking about two distinct phases of this process, before and during, right? And so before, I'm sensing that you kind of have a list of things that you want to know. You, in your head, you know what you need to know. Right? But then there are a whole bunch of wild cards that happen during. So I guess my question is how do you, what is the smoothest way to, for that process? Because you want to be able to go to a residency, I think, and be your resident, to be a resident, to do your work, to do your art, and not have to spend your days advocating for yourself. So how does the ideal process look for you? Um, having someone that I know I could go to um, as a point person, I think it makes it easier. Um, although, you know, a lot of times it doesn't work that way, but um, having someone that you know could be your point person would, is great. Um, yeah. So the person you know, you call um, Ann and, and say, hey, I have to go to the studio, there's a lip, I'm gonna be there at three and then that person just magically takes care of it. That yes. sort of thing. Okay, so from your end, how does that sound? Oh, I mean, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, at least at VSC, it's the only context I know. Um, part of this comes to our, our housekeeping and maintenance crew because they're like the hands-on, they check requests Day, throughout the day um, for everything from someone's window doesn't open to yes there's this uh, lip in the threshold could it be removed um, to we need another easel or the wall isn't flat enough I'm trying to draw against the wall so we, we have a system obviously it, it, it does need refined um, 
But I think uh, Christine had mentioned earlier this need for a point person and how things get handed off. And I think that's exactly how I found myself um, handling a lot of uh, accessibility issues at VSC is that I was the grants manager. And of course, because of funding and often federal funding, like we just, that person, it makes sense to then um, understand how accessibility works and doesn't work at an institution. But we have point people for, it just depends. If it's a food issue, we have people in the kitchen. If it's a, a 2D or a 3D studio need, we have different staff. So I think um, VSC, it's quite large. There's 30 staff to help accommodate the 55 people. Uh, but it still feels like we don't quite get to everybody every day. Um, I think this is a, a, a way of maybe refining that to have a single person who's just, it's clear who, who you go to, um, but because of all the, the, the realms in which an artist might move through in a day, um, I think there is some confusion and, and always uh, communication can, can solve a lot of that, but um, I hear that, that need. Question time. Oh, of course it's Reagan. Uh, Rebecca, I'm curious about your work as an artist. And sometimes when I look at artwork where disability is the subject, I feel like I can sometimes discern whether the work has been done by an artist who has a personal experience with disability or not. And I'm curious about your perspective on that and whether you feel like you see something that maybe people that ha don't have disabilities don't see. And also, Ryan, your perspective of whether you see something in Rebecca's work where other artists that try to capture the experience of disability without having the experience just don't quite hit the mark. So you mean on my own personal work or if I see work by other disabled artists? Yeah, well how you're, I guess how you're, when you're working um, in your own personal work, is there something maybe you feel like you're capturing that other artists that don't have disabilities kind of miss? Um, well, I think more, it's obviously really like my personal experience I, I can share um, in my art. Um, well, for example, I, I'm currently I'm working on um, a series of photo recreations of um, different iconic works of art or um, images in history. Um, and it started off with me recreating an image of Frida Kahlo, um, but inserting my wheelchair in all, in all of her images, but me sitting in, a, in my wheelchair, so that my chair was like very prominent. Um, and after doing that, um, I was, it, it's between me and, a, and two other artists, and um, she's in a chair as well. Um, but we're like, we could really do this with all sorts of images. Um, so we actually just finished up with doing The Last Supper, which everyone is a person with a disability, like all different, you know, someone who's blind and um, another person who's uh, short stature. And it was just awesome. Um, and um, we're going to be doing uh, Whistler's Mother and what's the other one? Rosie the Riveter with a, a woman who's an amputee. Um, so we're bringing like perspectives of disability, but it's kind of in your face, but it's also in, um, in a way that these are images that people recognize and that are in our brains, like society's brains that um, will, you know, you can look at it and then do like a double take and say like, oh, well this is, these are all people with disabilities. So I don't know if I answered your question, but um, I definitely think that, you know, disability is now prom very prominent in my work, um, but it's not always, I guess, in your face or, it's subtle, I think, um, and that I like that. Can I just say that you need to talk to the folks at the Andy Warhol Museum? <laughs> <laughs> because this, you know, um, and I want to say that we have been talking a lot about disability in art, but I want to make it extraordinarily clear that just because an artist has a disability does not mean their work has to be about disability. Their art is art. Whatever they want to explore, they can do. 
please keep that in mind. We don't want to shove people into a pigeonhole. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. And I also, I, lo I can see these in my head now, and <laughs> I love that. I, I don't have expertise to, to say looking at a piece of work if it was by someone who has that personal firsthand disability experience or, or, or not. Um, I mean, my world is writing, and again, um, I would say we've seen a range, right, of, of like the 16 to 20 artists um, who have come through VSC in the last five years on this um, Nielsen grant supported program. Uh, gosh, maybe a third peop of people, their work really speaks directly um, to disability, but two thirds it doesn't. So um, I can remember, I mean, in, in essence, part of the jurying, part of, part of the admissions process, I'll also just say, is just looking for excellent work of any stripe. Um, and so we hire out independent juries who are always looking at all work um, totally blind first. So they're seeing it um, without name, without any you know, identifying marks at all. They're just assessing the work um, on artistic merit and excellence. Um, and so of the, of the writers who I've gotten to know over the years, um, one, one man was writing a memoir about the, the person who shot him when he was a teenager, um, and, and that resulted in a spinal cord injury. But other, in some, you know, another poet was writing about um, her, her experiences with MS, but others are just, yeah, writing about whatever they're, they're writing um, or making art that is just the thing that's inside them they want to explore. Um. Uh, Rebecca, could you share your website if you've got one that, so that we can... I don't actually have one. Ah, okay. Well, that's why I couldn't find it when I just tried to Google it, because your, your work sounds really interesting. I just, um, I actually just started an Instagram thing, um, and it's uh, Rebecca RT. That won't help me. Yeah. What? <laughs> but, um, She's also actually, very modest, and I'd say Backbones, the organization she founded and, and leads, is quite excellent. But with, with that in mind about, about seeing your work, was also, could you put some of what you were, what you're doing with those photographs that you described and maybe juxtapose that with uh, the work of someone like Deanne Arbus, um, which I learned it's Deanne, not Diane, the other day, but, um, and some other folks who, who take images of people with disabilities but were not with those physical disabilities and any thoughts on, on those kind of documentary photographers um, and there's, a, there's another photographer who just passed away, George Duro from New Orleans, who put men who were missing limbs on pedestals as if they were Roman portions of, of you know, fragments of, of, these, of these sculptures. Um, I'm just interested. I'd just be interested to hear someone's perspectives. Are you asking sort of for of Rebecca's perspective of the portrayal of disability yes. in art? I guess art? so. Thank you, thank, you for, thank you for refining my question. <laughs> that's, that's what I do. Good. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, wait. Say it again. <laughs> what is your, when you're looking at art that portrays disability, what's your reaction to it? What do you want to see? I want to see real. Um, a lot of times disability has been images of people, um, it's either pity or it's inspiration. Um, so I think I want to see real and I, I don't want to see images of disability being the subject all the time. Um, but as a component of the whole, the whole thing, um, as part of the whole thing. What do you mean by real? Because, you know, I think your perspective of real is very different than the perspective of someone who does not use a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Well, I, what I mean is the, you know, there's a, there's a spectrum, going back to the pity and the inspiration, there's a whole spectrum in between. Um, of, of what people's lives are day to day. Um, and I don't want to see images of people be, you know, sad and hopeless or like in the, in the sunset going like this, you know? Um, it's, 
there's a lot there's a lot in between and a lot of differences and diversity that I think um, makes for excellent artistic content. So we are four minutes over, and I will help you give a round of applause for our two folks up here. So we're going to break and have lunch and come back at. Any other questions, feel free to write them on the post-its. Um, come back from lunch at 1 p.m. But you can, you can keep your lunch, and we can speak over the lunch if you need to. Thank you. <laughs>